Okay, welcome everyone to our first lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. So I have to adjust the slides. It was always called machine learning, but now it's called probabilistic reasoning. Why is it now called probabilistic reasoning? The reason is I have a very probabilistic perspective on machine learning, and there are other perspectives on machine learning. Yeah? So if I'm the only professor giving a lecture on machine learning, then it's called like this. But at TU Dortmund, we have the luxury that there are so many people doing machine learning, so you can get different perspectives. And this one will be a probabilistic perspective on the whole field, okay? Are these perspectives incompatible with each other? No, of course not. So I think the probabilistic one is the only true one, right? Of course. And when you get the probabilistic perspective, you will understand all the others, right? But ask someone else, and the someone else will tell you something differently. Yeah? So you should try to understand everything, and maybe things that you learned in BDA or in other lectures make sense from a different perspective. Yeah? So it's not completely different from maybe what you've seen so far. So where's my mouse? Let's click on it. So let's start with some administrative stuff, okay? So you all know where the otto Hahnstraße 14 is, so that's the first, first test very well. Um, it will be also here on Wednesday. Um, I typically have a feedback form, so after every lecture you can give, us, give me feedback on the lecture, okay? And it's anonymous in, um, in Moodle, so let me show you. So here's, here's our Moodle website, so it's very small, so there's a public folder on Cybo where you can download the slides and the exercise sheets, okay? And there's one for the communication via the matrix chat, the elements one. That's the one from fachschaften.org. Okay, so if you want to rant on the professor how stupid and bad he is, you shouldn't do it there because I'm also reading it and answering questions. So you have to find other channels for that. But if you have a question, please ask it here on this matrix chat. And I will also look at it and the TAs look at it. Okay, or maybe your fellow students look at it. So typical situation, you are sitting Saturday night and you're working on your homeworks, right? And having a good time. And then there's something, some problem maybe uh, with some exercise, and then you are just ask in the chat, right? And so you can say, I, I tried this and this and this, so why am I so stupid? Why can't I do this? And then maybe someone helps. So maybe even I, if I also have a great Saturday night at the computer. So, but um, not always. So here's the feedback form. I click on it once for you. So um, I'm not sure. You probably don't have these edit buttons, so you can just fill it up. Um, it's anonymous. Please put in a date here. So today would be... So what is it, 10, 10? So try to use this format. So it makes it easier than to sort stuff when I look at it in an Excel sheet or something. Yeah, and then you can just give me feedback. How did you like the lecture? Of course, it's very good. I knew that. And what did you not understand? Yeah, and then you can ask the question. So whatever, what is this letter X? All over the place. Yeah, you can also ask, um, ideally you would also put um, whatever, the slides, okay? So this is the first slide set, um, zero, 01, and it's on slide 17, okay? And then it makes it easy for me. If you find a typo on the slides, uh, you can also just put it into the chat, right? You can also put everything into the chat that you put in here, but maybe you want to, question, you want to ask something anonymously, okay? And do you have more comments, positive and negative? Of course, I always like the positive co comments a lot. That's nice to, to read it, right? And you see the hard work is paying off. But the negative have the advantage that maybe the lecture gets even better. So if you have something negative, have your suggestion or something, please tell me, okay? So that's fine. And um, for example, you could, a common negative comment is, are the exercises are way too difficult? So this is way, way too much work for so few credits. There I also have standard answers, of course, right, to this one. So. If it's very hard, you learn a lot. So that's the, the advantage. But let's see, right? Let's see what's coming. So what you dislike about the lecture. Good, and then you just submit it somewhere and I will see it, I will see it on some website or something. I have no idea where it appears. Okay, so this is the feedback form. Um, as I said, the slides will appear on um, Cybo and I copied the old slides from last year into a folder there in the public one. Just a second, and you can already preview what's going, what's coming. But I sometimes include new topics, or I sometimes change stuff. Hopefully, improve that question. Okay, very wrong then. So it's like in the LSF then. 
Yes, and it's much better actually. I didn't like this spot because I want to have lunch. Okay, great. So it's 14:15. So I please put it into the elements matrix jet, and then I will change it. Okay. I'm not uploading the slides on Moodle because um, when I do it with Cybo, I can just run it on my laptop, change the slides, and it will appear with every one of you. So you should also get like a slide, this Cybo service. I think you can also use the students, and then you will always have the up-to-date slides. Okay. Um, so maybe I put it on YouTube, but I will first try the Moodle thing. It's always the thing with copyright issues and stuff, and so it's better to have like a, a smaller platform. Then there will be übungen, and so we have um, a couple of people doing that. There's Tobias Ulver who sits over here. Maybe he will say something also about the übung. Then Mark Höfmann, it's another PhD student, and then another, I think it's, he's a master student, Aka Chandra Bald, yeah. So he's also helping us with the, with the übungen, okay? Tobias, do you want to say something already or later? Okay, thank you. So yes, we are, we are implementing this stuff from scratch. So in this lecture, it's not about using the tools. Maybe afterwards you can use the tools, but it's also about developing the tools, okay, so that you really understand what these tools are doing. Of course, it's much harder, possibly, right, solving quadratic programming problems or whatever, but it's also interesting to see all that all the math that you learned maybe in, in other other years, maybe you, you didn't like and now you will use it, yeah? And if you didn't get it yet, maybe then after this lecture you got it, yeah? Why the math is cool or what, you, what you're missing out. Good, again, matrix for announcement and discussion. So if there's something like whatever, some announcement, we will put it onto matrix, okay? So that's the easiest channel for us. Good, possibly we also do the submissions via Moodle, right? So that's something we are playing around with. Let's see how it works. Good. Again, let me stress for communication, please use elements. Don't send me emails. Um, so um, that's like, just not very efficient because then everyone asks the same stuff, right? And then I'm... So that's, that's much more efficient to ask it over here. And if you have something anonymous, then please use the feedback form. So that's also fine. And if all these doesn't apply to your thing that you want to tell me, then send me an email. Sure. No. But before sending me an email, think twice. I'm also reading the chat, okay? Very good. Exercises, <clears throat> as Tobias said, weekly on Cybo. Two students sent in one submission. Um, there might be exceptions, I think, for certain reasons, maybe, but it depends. We have only limited manpower. And so uh, typically the, the correction should also give you some hints how to do it better. And then it's, it's very hard to give you good hints if we have too many submissions. Okay, so just a question of, of manpower. Okay, that we have already. So the first sheet will be available on Wednesday. And the deadline will be next Tuesday, and the solutions will be after the deadline on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the Übungen. So when you chew on it, you will understand how this works. And that's why next week we have time for a Python tutorial in the Übungen, because there's no sheet yet to um, get the solution. Okay, exam. Um, I think those are the dates for the exam, the tentative dates. Um, my my, my um, exams always have like 100 minutes, and you always get 100 points. And 
no Hilfsmittel are allowed. So you cannot use books or stuff or you just have everything in your head. Okay? You can use a pen. Um, new. So this might be something you don't like. I like it a lot. It's very good. So that's like How did you get the admission for the exam? You get it by having on every sheet at least 50%. Yeah? So that's just, you know it all. So once you got the 50%, then suddenly the attendance drops down. And typically then people fail in the exam. So we've seen it very often. And so that's why we are doing it like this. However, you have two jokers. Okay? So there are always problems. You might be ill or, or, or okay? And then it's fine too. But we want to um, have you work. Okay? So you should really work hard. So that's our plan. The good thing is, at least that's how I would like to study, right? When I was a student, um, of course, I, I choose the simplest way through my studies, right? And so if there was a very tough lecture where I had to work a lot, I learned a lot, right? I mean, and that's our intention here as well, okay? Okay, the final grade is the grade of the exam. So far, so good. Any questions to the administrative stuff? If not now, again, we have chat and all these things, so please use it. Great. So here's some literature that um, you can have a look at. I'm not following a particular book here, but those are like very good books. And the best thing is in machine learning, lots of the stuff is free. Yeah. So you can really legally download all these books, these nice books, and they give you a different perspective on the same thing possibly. Right. So maybe all of them talk about neural network, but slightly different. And that's how I learned the stuff too. Right. I, I look at different books until I get it. Maybe I read the first book. And I don't get it. I don't understand the notation, blah, blah, blah. I try to understand it as much as possible. Then I take the next book and I read it, try to understand it. And at some point, it, it's, I have a click event and it suddenly works. Of course, you have the luxury of having live lectures. You can also ask here, right? So that's typically fine. Also, the stuff that you put in the feedback form. So let's say you put in the feedback form. I, I was completely lost in slide set three, slides 15 to 20. Here's my question. Why do you use this P of something the way you're using it? I'm completely lost. Then at the beginning of the next lecture, I can spend time on it and explain it again. Okay. So, and I typically do it. Depends on how much time we have, but I think that's, that's like the advantage of having a live lecture that we can be, we can more adjust to, to how you understand things. Then there are some non-free books. They are also very nice. Of course, you don't have to have them all, right? But maybe some of you want to, want to make a career in machine learning. Yeah, then have a look at them, right? Just have a look. Some you won't like, some you like, and depends on your background. Okay, very well. Again, please ask your question on matrix element and you can leave feedback on Moodle. Yeah, so that's how we should communicate. And if you have a very, 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 very good reason, send me an email. Okay, so that's okay. Great. So far, so good. Any more questions to the administrative stuff? If not, Then let's get like started slowly. Um, uh, maybe I have the first question. So until when do the lectures go? Like quarter two, 12? Is that the usual thing? Or when do lectures end? Or at 12 sharp? Is it like 90 minutes? Or everyone does it differently? 90 minutes. Okay, I will try to. Okay. And the slide sets, they are sorted by topic. Okay, so it can happen that maybe I haven't finished the topic completely. And then I will continue at that position next time. Okay, good. So let's start with the first question. So what is machine learning? And this is now my personal story, what machine learning is. So when you do computer programming 101, as the Americans would say, or Einführung in die Programmierung, or what is it called, DAP1 or something. So if you do DAP1, you learn programming, and then the beamer sleeps. So now, what's going on here? Here we go again. Okay, hmm, interesting. So... You solve problems like that one, okay? You have like, the task is you have an unsorted sequence of integers and you should write a computer program such that you get a sorted sequence, okay? And this is basically the specification of the problem now by, by an example. And we know very well how to do this, right? You know that you can do it in n log n. There are some weird algorithms like radix sort that are even faster if you understand how they do it really. But in principle, you need n log n or something. So it's very well studied. And we know everything about how to do these things. However, there are some more difficult problems. And that is, for example, you have an image of a handwritten digit and you want to calculate, again, with a computer program, what digit it is. Okay? And when you start with your um, 
introduction to programming knowledge and you try this with if then else and for loops, that's really difficult, okay? So you can start like, okay, so what is this by the way? So this is a matrix, right? So it's a two dimensional matrix and you have lots of zeros and then where the seven is, you get lots of ones. And so you can make a gigantic if then else program where you ask, so if there's something horizontally bit set and then something going diagonally down and something in the middle, then it's a seven. If it's more looking like this, then it might be a zero and, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. But in principle, you, it's very brittle and it's very tedious to do so. And at the end, it won't work very well, okay, to do it by hand. So here comes now the um, solution from machine learning. The idea is instead of um, creating a big if then else statement and trying to cover every case that can happen, you start with a data set, okay? So here's my data set. So those are images of handwritten digits, and those are the true results. So I put here like a different font. So this font basically means really the integer 5, and the computer knows what this is, the integer 5. It's a certain sequence of bits, okay? And the thing on the left is really a 2D image that you could take with your cell phone of your handwritten digits. So it's really like a matrix with some grayscale information in it, okay? And now the, the task to write this program from going from an input image to an output digit, yeah, is translated in, okay, here are lots of examples, and I ask all my students now to hand label them, yeah, use your brain, look at the left images, and now you have to hand label them. Ideally, 60,000 or millions or something, yeah, great task, but there are data sets like that, and now machine learning is doing the following. Machine learning is now automatically inferring a program, okay? So starting from a data set, we are creating a program which can solve this task, okay? That's a little bit like magic, but once you see how it's done, it's, it's very, um, very similar to things that you learn in statistics and uh, these kind of fields where you basically work with lots of data. So we are also working with lots of data and trying to automatically program complicated tasks, okay? So... This is my definition, yeah? I haven't seen it elsewhere, so maybe others have other definitions, but my definition of machine learning is it is automated programming, okay? So you let the computer program it itself. That's great, so we, are, we can do other things. We can go play piano, but that's not true because, of course, we have to program the computer such that it can automatically program itself. So when you are a machine learning researcher, then you have to write a program that reads in the data and you have to program a model, for example, a deep neural network or something. And then you need to train the model and fiddle around with the learning rate and all these things. So there's a lot of work to do. However, there is auto ML, yeah, and it has nothing to do with cars, but so there's automatic machine learning as well, which is trying to automate this task as well, right? Which is quite fancy. We are not going to talk about automatic machine learning, but we are using this like as our working definition. Yeah, We are trying to look at different models like a deep neural network, and then we have a data set, and then you will learn how to adjust the model such that it will be up to the task and solve the problem. The other thing is, so why, why now, why machine learning? Why is it such a big thing now, right? When you look at older books, I could have put here in some book on artificial intelligence from Russell Novik, yeah? Machine learning was just a small chapter in there. Yeah? So there are 10 chapters, knowledge representation and reasoning and whatever, computer vision, and, 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 and. And then there's one little chapter called learning machines or machine learning. And in that one, there's an even smaller chapter called deep learning. And it wasn't called deep learning, it was called neural networks. Okay? And so it is already known for a long time, this kind of trick. But now some things have changed. So... Now, with the internet and with all our pocket computers that we have, yeah, like cell phones, we can generate lots of data. Yeah? So this approach to learn automatically a complicated program from data suddenly becomes really feasible because we are generating so much data. Right? So if you imagine whatever your, your parents or your grandparents have, having a camera, an expensive one that you buy once, right? how many pictures did they take with it? Right? And maybe they had a 36... Um, images film in there and maybe if they were really enthusiastic they had a hundred of those so those are 3600 images how many do you have on your cell phone right i mean many many more and typically your face is on it 
right? So they are like the same stuff is on it and there's some context possibly, right? So there's a lot of data basically available. And so machine learning now can use that data. The second thing is, the second aspect is that computers are getting faster and faster. Don't tell it anyone else, but as computer scientists, we can always take the old ideas from 20 years ago and run it on modern machines. Bang, we have a new paper, perfect. Yeah? So that's really nice. So we can just recycle the old ideas and run it with better hardware, right? Of course, I'm a, I'm a little bit exaggerating, right? It's not exactly like this. There are also new ideas. But in principle, computers got faster and faster and faster. And these deep learning methods, why are they so successful? Because we are drowning in data, basically. So we have so much data generated now. And we have super fast computers. And deep learning scales linearly with the amount of data. Okay, so the last thing I say again. So deep learning scales linearly with the amount of data. So it's an O of N method. So if I have like, let's say, 1,000 images, okay, I, I need 1,000 minutes. And if I have 1 million images, I need a million minutes. Sounds a lot, but if you have n, n squared or n log n, uh, n log n is also okay, but n squared, methods that use n squared, they are basically applicable maybe for 1,000 images, but not for a million images. So machine learning is successful for two reasons, lots of data and lots of computation, and the methods typically scale linear. However, not all of them. And we will see many methods that don't scale linearly. Um, that are also interesting, and they are interesting because sometimes you have only smaller data sets, and then maybe there are alternatives to these big data stuff, okay? So, but, so this is a quote from John Nice Bit. I have no idea how to pronounce the last name. So we are drowning information and starving in knowing. So that basically refers to the fact that we are basically generating pictures and YouTube videos. So is there something? Yeah, so those are some numbers. I haven't updated them, but they're already impressive. They are like five years old. So like on YouTube, like 100 hours of video are uploaded every minute. So that's just incredible. No one can watch it. And I'm sure the numbers are much higher now already. Okay. And um, the other thing is, um, we have long genome sequences. So in bioinformatics, for example, we are also generating data and data and data. We have really nice hardware that can um, that can create a genome of you, right? If you have a certain illness, today it's like standard to create a genome of, of your inner cells, right? So to pick it out and then to get a file with letters in it. And all these data sets, they are interesting kind of to analyze and to see what we can do with it. So drowning in information means we are generating all this data and starving for knowing. So I would like to repair my bike, yeah? And I want to see on YouTube the video that explains me how to do that, right? So ideally machine learning could help here and automatically analyze the video and finding out where's the video that tells me how to repair my bike, for example, yeah? Okay. Oh, okay, also in science, so I personally like science application a lot, so I like medicine application and science application. Of course, there are also lots of commercial applications, and it's fine to do them, right? Of course, the big companies, they want to show you advertisements that you click on them, then they can make more money. You have to try to understand who's profiting, who's making money with it, and then you can make a decision whether you want to join in or not. So that's also applicable, but personally, I like um, scientific application, for example, telescopes, there's this new telescope at this Lagrange point. I forgot the name. James what? No, James something. Was it James? Yeah. James Webb. Ah, exactly. Uh, what? It's a different one. Yeah. So there's this super big telescope, and it's generating terabytes of data every night. Yeah. And no one can look at it. Also not be a bachelor student that get like the task to look at some of the files just to get like credit. So it's just too much data. Okay. So you need automatic methods that can, can do it. And those are all factors why machine learning now is um, like flourishing. Okay, so where's my mouse? There. So, a lot of stuff to do for us. Okay? And we have lots of data. Let's look at the data set. So this is a nice data set, the iris flower data set. So here it is. It's a small data set. Maybe that's, you might think, oh, okay, let's look at a, let, let's look at a super big one, but to understand the methods and to learn about them, it's often good to look at these ones. And this is the data set that was published in, did I write it up there? Yeah, in 1936 from Ronald Fisher. Um, and the thing was the use of multiple measurements in taxonomic problems, okay? So taxonomic problems, what could it be? I think it's botany here, so it's about plants. 
So you kind of want to make kind of a, a hierarchy of these different uh, lily iris flowers and you kind of trying to understand and make sense out of this data. And here each of each row is basically uh, each four numbers yeah, is just one data point for one iris setosa. So this is a picture of the iris setosa and it was generating four numbers. So a sepal length, a sepal width, a petal length and a petal width. And I always mix it up, which is which. So it's about these um, the leaves at the at the, the these colorful things. So they are like typically long leaves in blue, and then there are shorter leaves in blue. And one of them is the sepal, and the other one is the petal. Yeah, but I don't know which one. And then someone measured the length and the width. So 50 data points for the iris setosa, 50 data points for the iris versicolor, and 50 data points for the iris virginica. So this is a famous toy data set. So toy being, meaning we can play around with it. We can try methods on it and trying to understand what these methods are doing. And maybe also this could be test code. You, you have a fancy new method. If it completely fails on this data set, probably have a bug in your, in your code, okay? So this is like a nice data set to play, uh, play around with. By the way, I guess um, these numbers are centimeters. So it's 0 0.2 centimeters and that's 1.4 centimeters but you know for me as a computer scientist I don't care so much right at least if those are not it's not data from some killing robots or something right then I'm fine I'm, I'm happy with flowers so that's that's good okay so that's a great data set to do something now do you have any ideas what we could do with this data set so what kind of programs could we try to learn any suggestions yeah Yes, very good. So let me repeat it if you didn't hear it in the back. So we could implement a classifier, okay? So we, we, you are in your home garden at home or on your balcony and there's some iris flower. Then you take your, your ruler and you measure the lengths of these things, okay? And then you put the, you got four numbers and then you could ask, so which of these four, three columns matches my data points the best? And then I'm able to classify the iris versicolor. Sounds a bit boring in a way, but when you think about it, we are mechanizing a botanicist, right? So before you need like expert knowledge, you needed whatever, you, you did gardening, whatever, learned a job for three years or something, and then you knew everything about iris flowers. And then when you see one in your in another person's garden, they say, oh, that's a versicolor, nice one. Okay, very good. But now we are mechanizing it. We are generating a data set. And we as programmers have no idea how this works, right? We just use the data and we are generating an expert on iris flower, okay? So that's kind of fancy, I like it. Any other ideas what we could do with this? We could also mix everything up. We could mix all the data, we could forget about the labels in our data set, and then we could try to cluster the data, yeah? Just from the numbers. So every flower has four numbers, and you could imagine uh, maybe you cannot imagine very well in 4D, but let's say there are only three numbers. You have some cloud of points here, and here's another cloud of points. And the three axes are now sepal lengths, sepal width, and petal lengths. And I omitted one, okay, for visualization. <laughs> and when you just look at the data, yeah, when you just look at the raw data without knowing which is the Zetosa, which is the Versicolor and the Virginica, you could ask, so is it really true that those are like three different types or maybe there are four types so it could be that there are like four clusters of flowers and then you could invent it and you could say this is the iris hamelingensis for example yeah so great i'm i'm getting famous with iris question oh that would be very nice that of course yeah so you're saying taking these three four numbers and then generating an image like that but we need another data set for that Unfortunately, in 1936, I guess the battery was empty of the digital camera of Ronald, and so he didn't take pictures. He, he just um, uh, wrote down the numbers, and I guess um, he didn't mention the person who did this. So maybe he just got the data set from some other department. So I don't know who's collected the data. You should, should have a look at the paper, maybe. So, and they just wrote down the numbers. And so they don't have the images. But in principle, we could say, let's make a new data set. Let's make one where we have these numbers, 
and we take an image of these ones. And then we could have a fancy deep learning setup to generate images from just these numbers, right? Great. Anything else that we could do? We could also calculate correlations between these things, right? So it could be that the petal width is always super correlated with the sepal width. Yeah, could be. So there could be some knowledge in here. Again, we are not botanicists. We are computer scientists. We have no idea about plants, right? We just look at the data, and then we have an insight, and then we go back to the botanist and say, uh, I looked at the data. Super interesting connection between the, the sepal width and the petal width. So there was some super strong correlation. Is it already known? And then the botanicist says, no, I didn't know that. Great, let's write a paper on this one. So let's make get more data and let's um, publish this. So that might be a nature paper. Uh, so that might be great. So, so many things are possible. Um, I show you now in a Jupyter notebook, like a little bit of code, how this would now look as code in machine learning if you were allowed to use the toolbox. Okay. Of course, in this lecture, you're not allowed to use the toolbox. But um, you will learn how to do this, how to implement the stuff yourself. Okay, so where's my simple demo? It's up here. Um, let me just run the code once and hope for the best that it works. So how many have never seen Python code? Okay, some of you. How many have never programmed Python code? Okay, more, so that's consistent. Um, how many think they are super good at programming Python code? None of you. Okay, me neither. But that's not required. So you will be able to understand the code just by looking at it. Okay? So let's see. First of all, um, whoops, the handling is a bit difficult. So this is the Jupyter Notebook. Yeah, that's like running in my web browser. Um, it's an interface to a Python kernel running on my laptop. And it gives me a nice view on the code. So for example, I could do things like this. I could, um, let's generate a new cell. So I have these computation cells, okay? And I can put some code in here. And then with shift return, it gets executed, okay? And that's super, super useful. I think the first who did this was Mathematica. So very nice language, unfortunately quite expensive. But so you can generate, uh, put the code in here and you can play around with the execution. So in Java, you write, lots of files, lots of Java files, you compile them and then you run them, okay? And this is much more interactive, okay? So here you can put the code and you can look at the result. And the nicest thing is you can even do things like this one. So that is also just a, um, a cell, but it's a markdown cell. So you can have markdown. Markdown is this very nice ASCII-based like uh, text set stuff. So you could also um, put mathematics in here even if you know LaTeX a bit x equals backslash pi. So you can also put math code in here and it will render very nicely. And so you can have all these cells and put code in there and you can program around with it and you can document your stuff. And maybe uh, also some homeworks like that, possibly. Yeah, possibly from us you get a, a notebook with some missing, missing things and you need to implement the missing stuff, okay? So, okay. So now, next thing. So what did I implement already? So those are all toolboxes. And that's the way you are not supposed to do it, but I always do it. But Tobias probably would yell at me to do it like this. I'm always implementing from, uh, I'm always importing from the toolbox numpy all the functions that I need because I hate to write numpy.h stack. Then the code just gets too cluttered. But you have to find out yourself and maybe Tobias will yell at you if you do it wrong. But he... He doesn't yell at me, luckily, so that's good. Um, so those are all libraries that exist already. For example, sklearn, that's a library for machine learning. And it has lots of stuff. So for example, the iris data set is in there. So I, I load from the sklearn.data set. One, I load a function called load iris. And then I have the iris data set here to play around with. Or I have some nearest neighbor methods. We will learn about it or linear regression or, or, or. so many, many different things. Okay, so let's load the iris data set. So I assign to my variable iris the result of load iris. And after having done this, uh, we can also look at the variable what's in there. So, okay, what is in the iris one? So it's somehow some curly bracket 
And then data. So this is a dictionary that you might see, right? So the key is data, and the value is basically an array that then follows. So what else is in here? So those are all these ones. Great. Ah, and then there's the target. So that's another key. And the value of the key target is now an array of zeros, ones, and two. Any ideas what these zeros, ones, and twos are? I mean, we've seen these, yeah? Yeah, those are the class labels, okay? And let's scroll further. Ah, oh, there's also conveniently the target names. It's an array of strings. It was a vesicular virginica, blah, blah, blah. And some other meta information, which is not nicely rendered here on my screen. Here. Okay. Good. So let's visualize it. So for that, I'm using like a fancy library called Plotly um, that does it really very nicely. So I pick some axes. So I have four axes. In Python, we always start with zero. So the four axes are called zero, one, two, three. Okay. And I only plot the first three because then I have a 3D plot. And it's called scatter 3D. And I, I tell it, What should be the X values? It should be like the Ith column of my data set. And the Y values should be the Jth column and the Kth column is the Z. And I can also give colors and I'm just using the name information here for the colors. And that's like a fancy plotting routine. I just show you the result. Okay, so that's then what you get. And in this um, fancy toolbox, you can also like turn around it. So it's really super cool, I think. So I like it a lot. And now what do we see? We see now three of these four numbers as coordinates. And so for every plant that has been measured, I get one point. And then I have a color. And the color is coming from the targets, zero, one, or two. Okay. And now this plotting routine is doing it nice and fancy, telling me what this is. What happens when I click, click it? Ah, okay. I can even switch it off. Fancy. Yeah, okay. So you see, this is like a nice library to play around with. Okay, so that's my data set. Um, Now, let's say I want to learn on this one. So I could use all the data set, okay? But then, and then I would get a classifier that would tell me, okay, with these numbers, I guess it's an iris etosa. But to learn on all the data sets, it might not be a good idea. So it's better to split it into a training data set and into a testing data set, okay? On the training data set, I learn my model. And on the testing data set, then I can test how well it works. So in the testing data sets are flowers that haven't been used for the machine learning, so I can just use it for trying, okay? And so there's some code to do this. And I, I'm not showing you every detail here now. Let's just visualize it. So if I do it randomly, then now here you have like circles and disks. And so the disks are the train one and the circles are the um, test one. Question. Ah, very good question. I'm always asked this question and I have no answer. Um, so that's a typical practitioner's question. So people come with a data set from a hospital and then they say, so how many data points do we need? We have already 60, do we need more? And then, okay, the more you have, the better. Um, now, how do you split it in training and test? So if I um, split 60 data points into two halves, 30 and 30, then the problem might be that the 30 data points are not very descriptive of the problem and it's very hard to learn a good model, right? On the other hand, if my test data set is very, very small, then the estimate of the test error is very noisy. So that's like a trade-off thing. And there might be theory, but I'm not, I don't know it. So I don't know it very well. So it's something that you do like this. Of course, there are some tricks. You can repeat the experiment. You can do these random splits very often, right? And then you can average the result at the end. And then you get a better estimation. Okay, so that's my data now. Um, let's do some classification. So the goal here is to learn a function that takes four numbers and then it tells me what type of iris flower it is. Okay. So let's see what are we ta we take the k nearest neighbor classifier. Okay. The one nearest neighbor classifier. And this is just how you do it in this sklearn data set. You fit your model onto the data. Okay. So you put in the data here and you fit it. So this And N is now an object, so it's like object-oriented programming, kind of. So it's a model for Kenyo's neighbor classifier, and you can fit it to data. Whatever, however it works. I tell you how the Kenyo's neighbor classifier works. If you have a new data point in this point cloud, you are uh, estimating the distances to all the data sets that you have, and then you say, I'm the same label as the closest one. 
Okay, so that is the one nearest neighbor classifier. You just say I have the same label as the one that is closest to me. Okay, and in a way that's okay, but when it's very noisy, it might not work very well. So let's see how well it works here. So we can calculate the train accuracy. So the accuracy basically checks how many of the predicted ones are correct. And then basically the proportion of correct one is the accuracy. So one minus the accuracy is the error, okay? So basically here it's perfect. So on the training set, everything is great. And if I now take the test set, I can um, now classify my test set and compare it with the Y test. And the Y test are the labels that I haven't used for training my classifier, okay? So this is not really the, the test, whether I did a good job or not. And here you see you get 0 0.97, so about 3% error, which is not bad, right? If you take a botanist student and show them some iris flower, I'm sure they will also do 3% wrong, right? So it's not so easy task to really distinguish these things. Okay, so that is then calculated on the test set. Now we can also visualize the ones that are wrong. And curiously, there are the ones that are um, like in between, so the ones that are just at the border. So those are the ones that get a wrong label, okay? So that basically means there might have been like a blue one over here close to this green circle, and so the green circle got the blue label, and it should have gotten the green label, okay? Great, okay, so what else can we do? How much time do we have? Plenty of time. Um, okay, so what else do we have? Um, yeah, we can also plot the, the wrong ones, yeah, which were only Virginica false, so only this class, so the other ones were perfect. We can plot them with a training set, and then basically we can see what was going on. So basically these red circles here, they are too close to a filled blue one from my training set, and that's why they got the wrong label. Now what I'm doing here is super important. When you do machine learning, you get a data set, you run sklearn or some other stuff, and then you get this number, 0 0.97, and then you say, great, I have a product, I can have an app, I, I will be rich soon. But of course, you should look at the results more closely. You should understand why is it sometimes wrong? So where's the mistake? Can I improve on my results? Or can I, can I basically understand why it's wrong? Or is it just a bug in my code, okay? Like nearest neighbor implementations, you calculate the distance to everyone else, and then you take the one nearest neighbor. You have to always be careful not to compare with yourself because the distance with yourself is zero, okay? So you have to be careful with the minimum and these kind of things. So there are always lots of bugs. So you should always also look at the data somehow, okay? Good, what else do we have? Regression. So we had classification. Um, let me draw a little um, matrix here. Um, so basically, we are in machine learning. We are learning a function from some input to some output. Okay, so simple, right? This also applies to programming 101: an unsorted sequence, a sorted sequence, or a digit, handwritten digit, and the true label. And now these things like classification, regression, and some other things that we will see, we can put into the following matrix here. Um, so there's supervised learning. And if there's supervised learning, there's also unsupervised learning. And now the question is, um, what do I put here on the rows? So my Y could be a discrete set. Now, discrete, if you don't know this, so this is like a mathematician's term for countably, okay? For example, the set 1 to 3 is a discrete set. Yeah, the real numbers is a continuous set. So that's the other one. And I already, I think you can't see it on the video now, what I'm doing here. So let me just, trying to, uh, okay. I think I have a problem with the contrast. So sorry, but I put this also with more contrast in older videos. Oh, that's a better pen, maybe. Okay, good. Can you throw it? 
Okay, Jay, let me put that. Is it your private pen? Thank you. Awesome. Shall we switch? Do you want this one? <laughs> okay, so it's a higher contrast, but now we have to kind of deblur this. Okay, so it's also not so easy to. to and maybe I should just wait. So we have the dimension supervised versus unsupervised, and we have the dimension why is this feed and why is it genius? Okay, great. And we've seen already if the y is discrete, like 0, 1, and 2. Supervised means my data set contains the labels. Okay, then what is this thing called? We had it already. Yeah? Classification. Classification, very good. So supervised basically means x and y is known. Unsupervised means only the x is known. Great. So what about if I have x and y, and y is now continuous? What's the name? You know it? Who else? Regression. Very good. So now it's getting more interesting. Some data sets you're only giving the x. Okay, so somehow the, the, the students who made this iris data set went into the park, wrote down all these numbers, came home, and then the professor she asked, "So now, what about the labels? So you didn't you didn't tell me what it is?" Ah, uh, oh, okay, damn. Okay, I have to do my work again. But sometimes, if the data is nice, like up here, you can do something with the data if you assume that the y is discrete. So if you assume the y is discrete. But you're only given the axes, the algorithms are called? Uh, clustering. clustering, very good. So, if with these two by two matrices, you know, when you do an MBA, I think all your study is having two by two matrices, and there's something clever in each of the corners. So, what's <laughs> clever in this corner here? Any ideas? Try it. DCA, very good, yes. Okay. I hope you won't be bored by our class if you know this already. So DCA is an example. That's right. DCA is basically inventing a Y that is continuous. Okay, I will show you in a second. So basically, or I can also show you with, with hands, you have um, your, your clusters of data points maybe. Let's view it like a big cigar, like a big long cluster. And now PCA will tell you in which direction is the variance maximized, okay? And then you can rotate the whole space and you will have it aligned with the axis. This is also called kahun löwe transformation or Hauptachsen-Transformation. And I think there are 20 names for this. And one is PCA. Yes, very good. And what would be a name for this? So this is like a particular message. Uh, message. So there are other methods. So I use one. I think that is another one. Or LLE is another one. So what would be the a good name for this one? Okay, I give you. It's typically called dimensionality reduction. <coughs> this is not so common as classification and regression. Okay? Um, so this, this name, dimensionality reduction, is not so common. PCA is super common, of course. So that's what people are doing. Okay, let's Let's again look at the notebook and let's see um, in regression. So what are we doing? So we could try to have as the input like the first three numbers. Okay, in Python you would write it so you have the chain data and you kind of take the first three. Okay, this is wrong. So it should be colon like this. So you take all rows, colon says all rows, and then from the columns, you take all columns up to the third one, okay? And the output will be basically all rows and then exactly the third column, okay? So the three here means the three is not in there. So it's only zero, one, two, and the three is excluded. And then I can do a linear regression. So trying to predict the last column from the first three columns. 
And in linear regression, you get these coefficients. So those are like weights, right? And then you get something like, um, so let me, can I switch with this one? Okay. Um, so for example, this one would be, so it gets 3 is equal to minus 2.5 is 0 plus 0 to 9 um, plus 0 for 5 is 2. Where I am now also using this convention like in Python. So this is the first value of my data, this is the second, the third one, and this is the fourth value. So with linear regression, we are learning a linear function, right, which is predicting one of the columns. Why is it interesting? Because, ah, interesting, the, these ones, they are not so important to predict that one, but the, the last one, which kind of makes sense, because this was like sepal and sepal something, and this was petal and petal. So basically, if the petal width is large, and probably the petal length will be also large. Okay, so they are more strongly correlated. However, not exactly, yeah? so it's a little bit like that. And then there's also this intercept um, minus blah, 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 so I need to add that one as well, so minus, okay, so that's just a constant term. Okay, great. Okay, so this is uh, linear regression. Now you might ask, linear regression, isn't it statistics? Yeah, it is statistics, but in machine learning, you also learn about linear regression. We are also using it. In machine learning, we use whatever works. We are kind of cannibalizing all the others. All the, we get all the methods from whomever has something good. We try to integrate it in our stuff and combine it with deep learning or blah, blah, blah. Okay? But of course, the statisticians here at TU Dortmund, they know much, much more about linear regression than I do. Yeah? So I only can give you like a superficial thing on it. But we will have a lecture on linear regression too. Okay, great. So I can also calculate a train error. Okay, now here I'm not comparing um, the labels, whether they're exact, but I'm comparing the square distance between like what's predicted and what the true value is of the last column. And then to the power of two. So it's like a squared error. Okay. And this number, 0 0.19. So is it good if it's small or is it good if it's large? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Because when it's small, basically all these differences are very small, and that means my prediction was very good. Okay? Okay, excellent. I can again distinguish between chain and test error, and surprisingly in this data set now, how I did the random split, the test error is smaller than the training error, which is a bit surprising. Yeah. Typically, we would expect it to be a little bit larger. So, clustering, unsupervised learning. Okay. We are using here k-means, and k-means, you might have learned about it already. It will, there will be also lectures on k-means if you haven't, okay? So in k-means, we basically are ignoring the um, labels, and we are calculating labels. And those are the labels that we are calculating. So what is it? Nah. So let's try to make sense out of this. So there are these different things colored. So there is the versicolor getting label 2. And then there's the Virginica getting label 2. So they were put into the same cluster. So all the circles is one cluster. And as you can see, there's some red ones that are also in the cluster of the blue ones. So it mixes it up a little bit. Okay. Similarly, these squares. So also there's the Vesicula and Virginica got mixed up. So it kind of works. It kind of works. Okay. The clustering is a very interesting method because that's really close to scientific discovery, right? So let's say you're an astronomer and you are measuring the, the whatever, the, the spectrum of lots of stars in our Milky Way or something. And then you have all these spectra yeah? and then you can try to cluster them into different groups. And then you say, okay, this group I call white dwarfs. And this thing I call like soul-like, and this thing I call supernova. And so you do basically cluster the stuff and invent names for it. And here are basically methods that try to mechanize it and do it automatically. Okay. Okay. Then we have PCA, as you said. Very good. So unsupervised cluster, unsupervised learning. The clustering was also unsupervised, and now the PCA is looking for the direction of largest. Uh, 
<coughs> um, largest variance. And so my plots are, where is it? And now what happened here? So basically, I turned around the coordinate system in such a way that one of the axes like, has as much variance as possible. Okay? Before it was like a cigar, which was like going diagonally through the space. And now it's really going like exactly aligned with the largest dimension. So why is that something useful? Now let's say you have a classification problem uh, with very high dimensional data. Maybe the classification label is only contained in a few of the directions or in a linear combination of the directions. And with PCA, you get like the one that gives you the most variance. And that might be also the direction which gives you like a good classification at the end. But not necessarily. But in principle, so you could practically think about this like that. Okay. So this is a note from Tobias. So we have used sklearn, but in this lecture you won't use it. Um, of course, it's not forbidden, right? So if you have an exercise and you need to implement PCA for us, you can compare it with the output of the PCA from sklearn. That, that's fine, right? But you have to do the eigenvector decomposition code yourself. And then you can compare it, basically, the results from one and the other. And maybe this helps you find bugs, okay? Or maybe you find a bug in sklearn. Great. So, any questions about the Jupyter Notebook stuff? There are also ways to use it online. So there's Google Colab, for example. When you like Google and you have an account, then you can also for free use there some um, notebooks on their servers. However, you can also locally install it. It's all open source and you can get it to run, but sometimes it's a bit tricky to get it to run. Yeah, but I, I have no idea how to do it on Windows, but I think if, if there are enough people having the same operating system, then you will figure it out to, to get this to run. Okay, so far so good. Um, we've seen different types of machine learning, discrete outputs, continuous outputs. However, we could also have other structures, okay? So what do I mean by that one? Uh, where's my mouse? There. So in principle, oh, that was a good pen. Um, Why could be something else? Could be graphs, right? I mean, we are computer scientists. So, so what could it be? It could be, for example, a setup which kind of has some measured properties of some molecules, yeah, whatever, some how it develops under pressure, how this happens, blah 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 blah. So, we have a long vector describing the molecule, and then you are trying to generate the graph. And as long as you have training data, yeah, you might be able to do this. Okay. Of course, the X might be a graph too. So the um, solution might be, uh, yeah, typically, let's say it's R to the D, but it could be also graphs. And then basically, you ask the question, given a molecule with some certain structure, what is the total charge of my molecule, for example? And those are, of course, super interesting things. Question. What's that? Ah, yeah, very good question. So, of course, we know how to compare discrete things just by using equality. We know how to compare to continuous numbers just by using least squares, right? How do you compare to graphs? You can come up with it yourself. For example, you could try to find a graph matching between two graphs. You could, for example, calculate features of the graph. So you could calculate, so what is the maximum number of outgoing edges in one, or what is the minimum one, or what is the average one, and so on and so forth. What is the number of nodes? And then you can define the distance on that one. But it's not simple. You're totally right. So it's not so easy. And the X could be lots of other things, of course. Also images. We had that example already. So that would be now R to the D cross C. Or maybe you have complex numbers. Why not? Sure. As long as you can calculate distances, then you can use it. And similar for the output. Okay, so let's switch back. Okay, so here we go. Then we've seen briefly unsupervised learning. And of course, there's more. There's also semi-supervised learning, which I haven't talked about it. So that's like in between. So let's say you have some labels known, but some of them are unknown. Okay, so for example, we have a big data set of handwritten digits. 
but only some of them have a label and some of them don't. Okay, so that's also a very interesting case, what you can do in that, that one. And then there's reinforcement learning, that's a completely different story. Yeah? However, in reinforcement learning, we use, of course, all this stuff from machine learning that we did. So we typically use supervised learning or unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning to do reinforcement learning. Just very briefly, reinforcement learning is the stuff to have like a, a computer play Go or chess very well, or play games or Atari games or this kind of stuff. And also robotics application have a lot of reinforcement learning. Okay. So far, so good. So what are the tools that we are using? We are using probability theory, and that's what we will start with on Wednesday. In particular, Bayes' rule is like the most important one. Question? Ah, okay. So let's forget about reinforcement learning. So semi-supervised learning is between supervised and unsupervised. So you have a big data set of um, digits that have a label, so that have a Y. And then you have another big data set just of digits that don't have a label. And now by thinking about using some clever clustering techniques or something, you can make use of this additional data. Okay? And that's a common situation because labeling is expensive. And so that's a very practical one, the semi-supervised one. So reinforcement learning setup is more, you have an environment and you interact with the environment and you get feedback and you try to learn from that. So that's like you're generating your data on the fly, kind of. But when you know all of this, then you are also well prepared for reinforcement learning. Any other questions? Okay, then the tools, as I said, probability theory, you need linear algebra, Vectors and matrices, that's like the lingua franca, so the one that, so writing stuff on the board, right? So, for example, eigenvector decomposition, uh, you could write it like this. Is it right? Yeah, whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like this, for example. You can use some clever notation, and it's typically all linear algebra, so many things. So that's like a diagonal matrix, and those are the unitary matrices coming from left and right. Now I say, those are many words that I only rarely use, and I have no idea what an eigenvector is, and I have no idea what a unitary matrix is. That is no problem. We will cover that in the, in the chapter on PCA. And otherwise, you should ask, okay? Or look it up, or look um, some YouTube video on it, but you can also ask here. Okay, what else? Optimization. So we have a function f that we want to minimize in x. So we're trying to find the x that minimizes the f. That sounds a bit boring. However, if the x is like a high dimensional vector, like a hundred dimensional, then suddenly it gets interesting, okay? Or the x could be all the weights in your neural network, for example, okay? And then it's kind of more fancy. So we are doing these optimization things. Um, and we might have side conditions as well here, okay? This is, for, for example, the basis for support vector machines. Yeah, that's another method for classification, and um, you need to solve an optimization problem to implement it. Okay, what else? And then we need computer science, and I write all the things you learned so far and more. Okay, which is good, right? I mean, great. You need like some shortest pairs algorithm from DAP, DAP2 or DAP3 or 4. I don't know how many DAPs are there. But, but so you need all these algorithms. And if you think there's an algorithm that I don't use in machine learning, then think harder. So maybe you can come up with a new idea how to use that algorithm. Yeah, algorithms like these all pairs, shortest part, freud Warshall algorithm, super clever thing. And how is the connection to machine learning? That's really curious. But we will have the connection when we talk about the method isomap. Okay, that will use the freud Warshall algorithm of calculating all pairs, shortest paths which is then really surprising. So I find it quite surprising. The thing is, these algorithms where people got famous with, there's usually something super clever in, something super non-trivial in. And then if you can translate this non-triviality into a machine learning problem, that's great. That's usually kind of then things connect. Also, um, you might, so in computer science, Many students don't like the math lectures and they are wondering, so why I get tortured with all this stuff in the first semesters and I failed already three times and so it's really, I'm already done with my bachelor thesis and I'm still missing the, the, the math. What are they called? So these muffin, a muffin, I am muffin, muffin. Yeah, so the muffin things. 
And so why get I tortured with it? I want to program websites, right? Okay, then go ahead and program websites. But if you want to do machine learning, you will need it all. And the more mass you know, the better. However, the good, good message for you is if you were not so much into mass yet, now you might see the mass again into a different context where you see that it makes sense and that it's useful, okay? And if you don't know what a derivative is, please ask. If you ask 10 times, maybe then I refer you to the video from last time or something. But just ask if you don't understand something, right? Good, so far so good. This is a quick overview of the lectures. Of course, this is like the ideal situation. It won't be like that, but let's see. We will start with probabilities, um, base rule, continuous one, Gaussian distributions, and then we do linear regression. Then we do some cool matrix differential calculus. This is some super cool tools on, uh, to, to calculate derivatives of functions that have like vectors or matrices as inputs. So that's very nice. So I like it a lot. Model selection, support vector machines, and some stuff about it. So isomap, these things are like nonlinear dimensionality reduction methods. We also are talking about EM, which is basically a generalized point of view for k-means. So k-means you might know, yeah, so that's a nice method, but there's a more general point of view to look at, at EM procedures. So there's a more general way to look at it in terms of latent variable models, which is quite interesting. We are going to talk about neural networks. There's one lecture typically on causality, which is a fun topic, which I like a lot and which I think has like a great future. And Gaussian processes, that those are just Gaussian distributions generalized to functions, okay? So a univariate Gaussian is like a Gaussian for a real number. A multivariate Gaussian is a Gaussian for a finite dimensional vector. And a Gaussian process is a Gaussian for continuous functions, okay? And that sounds cool, and it is really cool. Yeah. So, And you can also use it for classification and regression and all these things. And finally, we talk about sampling. So that's like another tool to do some difficult calculations. And we also talk about statistical learning theory, where I'm not at all an expert, but I want to give you a flavor of it, Okay, how it works. So that when you're on a party, then you can chat a bit about statistical learning theory, that you also know approximately what it is. And some other stuff. Let's see. There might be more topics that I will include later on. Question. Will there be any lecture about feature selection? Feature selection, good, good question. Not I, I don't have it, I won't have feature selection exactly in here. But um, like when you do linear regression, this is doing kind of a feature selection because it gives you a different weights for your method. And in a way, the PCA is also a kind of a feature selection thing. But um, so there are these different branches in like machine learning. One is more like um, data science way of thinking, or there are some other words for it. And then here we are more in a machine learning type of setting where we look at the foundations a little bit. So that's more the focus. But I believe that learning about this stuff will be useful to do good feature selection, yeah, ideally. So I hope you won't waste your time in this semester in the lecture. And at the end, it does, it's not true what I said, but I think it's approximately true. Yeah. OK, any more question to that one? So here's the summary. We are ready right at the end. Oh, so 20 minutes early, but that's fine. Um, so what is machine learning? Machine learning is automated programming. So learning from data. So that's machine learning. That's it. And there are many, many ways to do it. And we will study the basics and we use fancy mathematical tools. We will use joint probability distributions. We will use optimization, linear algebra, and all this stuff. Okay. And I hope you will enjoy the lecture. So this is my last slide. Thanks a lot for your attention. And if there are more questions, go ahead.